Several years ago, my parents had a really good idea. Um, in order to keep us focused on giving, they decided instead that we would give gifts as a family through World Vision. Anybody ever done that? They, could, they let you buy things for people, buy a goat, buy a tree, yeah. So my parents thought that'd be great to kind of get us stop focusing on ourselves and focus on others. I think we made donations in order to provide some goats and a tree that would enable people in Africa to better provide for their families. Now our children were young at the time and they had, didn't have a problem with this. They thought it was kind of neat, you know, when they were young, when they were little. In fact, Susanna, who's not here this morning, suggested that we send them some of Grandma's cats <laughs> to help out. You know, if they needed animals, then let's send them some cats. <laughs> we didn't actually do that, but it was a nice idea. Um, but then fast forward to 2017, the kids are a little bit older. And I'm sorry, guys, this is going to embarrass you a little bit. <laughs> I'm a preacher, and this is kind of what we do. Fast forward to 2017, my parents decided again that in the spirit of generosity, they would give gifts on behalf of our children through World Vision rather than giving gifts to my children. So one of my kids quickly responded that we should give their gifts to World Vision in order to get back at them. <laughs> so I'm not going to say which. So that they might have been missing the point. Maybe we were all missing the point of Christmas. But needless to say, whether you're a child or an adult, it's easy to get distracted during Christmas, isn't it? What kind of things do we focus on other than Jesus? Gifts. Gifts, okay. <laughs> yeah, obvious. What get else? Get-togethers. Sorry? Get-togethers. Get get-togethers? Oh, man, mama's busy, right? Decorating. Decorating is something we get distracted yes. by. I'll tell you, is a, is a, is a, the, the responsible one over the checkbook, I'll tell you what I get distracted by. It's like, where is all that? What are you doing? No, stop. Slow down. What's the budget for Christmas? No budget for Christmas. She says, what is it? I'm the Grinch and you're, you must be Santa Claus. What is it, Cindy Lou? Oh, yeah, she's Cindy Lou Who and I'm the Grinch. I just, I'm just misunderstood, guys. You know, watch the Jim Carrey version. He, he, it's redeemed. <laughs> so we can get distracted at Christmas. As our pants get tighter. Uh-oh, that happens, doesn't it? As our wallets get lighter. Huh? As our calendars are overflowing. That's right. Busyness with an abundance of opportunities. It's difficult to stay focused on the reason for the season. So how can we take steps to keep the main thing, the main thing, this Christmas? Well, I believe one important step is for us to begin at the beginning of Christmas, and it's not going to be where you think it is, so that we can understand what Christmas is and what it's not. So we're going to need to go beyond Scrooge, and I like Scrooge. Great story, right? Anybody seen the Bill Murray version? Pretty funny. Okay. We're going to need to go beyond Scrooge. We need to go, we need to go beyond Frosty. Huh? We love Frosty, but it's not about Frosty. We've got to go beyond Ralphie. Does anybody get that reference? Okay. Another one of my You'll favorite movies. Your You'll shoot your eye out. I knew somebody would say that. <laughs> Got to go beyond Ralphie. You know the scene I always remember is when Ralphie's imagining that the the, the paper that he's written is going to get glowing reviews from the teacher, and so she's writing A plus plus plus, and she's saying this is the paper I've waited my entire life for, <laughs> and she gives him a C plus anyway. <laughs> So this is going to be the purpose of our journey over the next several Sundays. This week, we'll begin by illustrating how Christmas is the solution to a problem that began in the Garden of Eden. Next, we're going to discuss how the forces of evil have been intent on thwarting God's plan to resolve the problem originated in week one. And finally, in week three, we're going to discuss the essential ingredient to any story worth telling. We'll talk about how God allows people to both shape and be shaped by the story he is writing. But first, we'll start where it all started, back in Genesis chapter 3. So, probably caught you off guard, huh? Christmas didn't start in Luke 2. Christmas started in Genesis 3. So, the first point today is that the problem originated with Adam and Eve. At this point in history, what do you think would have been man's attitude towards God in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve, what was their attitude towards God? A great provider. Okay, he's a provider. 
What else? They're in the Garden of Eden. He's a companion. Okay, God's a companion. Yeah, he was present with them. He's present with them. He's their dad. Okay, Father. What did they do with him every day in the Garden? It says in Scripture. Walked with him. They walked with him. Every day. Can you imagine in the Garden with God every day talking and walking? And relating to God. God provides for you. God is there for you. So what's your attitude towards God? At that point. Simple. Childlike trust. Beautiful, isn't it? And, that, and what's so encouraging about that to me. Is that is the God that we serve. That's what he intended for you. And for me. When he created the world. Was that simple. Childlike trust. And that intimacy of daily being with him. That's what God intended. But it didn't turn out that way. Okay? In Genesis chapter 3, even though God has given them no reason to distrust him, man encounters a dilemma. The first woman, Eve, communicates with a being that calls into question God's character and contradicts what God has said, and she's faced with a choice. Who do I trust? And again, like we said, at this point, the earth was uncorrupted. Man's relationship with God was as it was intended, pure intimacy. What do, you, do you remember what things were like with your spouse before you had your first argument? Do you remember what your first argument was about? <laughs> Anybody want to share? We argued about a biscuit on our honeymoon. No, two things, a biscuit and a pack of gum. The biscuit issue, have I told this before? I know I'm getting up there. So on our honeymoon, we had Cracker Barrel, which is a really good restaurant, by the way. And she left a biscuit on her plate, which in my mind, in my family, means that she didn't want it. Well, I was wrong. We had a tangle about that. Good nature, you know, we're still trying to keep up appearances. And then she went in to buy it to the gas station and asked, she asked me for money for a pack of gum. And I said, you need a pack of gum. And that was it. That was problem number two. <laughs> but can you remember back when there were no issues? Or what about when your children, sorry guys, were sweet and innocent? You remember that? Before they ever thought about talking back to you? Remember what it was like? Okay. Or what about when you first start that job? And it's like, ah, oh, it's so great. I'm so relieved to have a job. I'm, everybody's great. The boss is great. You know, the pay is great. And then over time, things start to change. The, the shine wears off. Maybe your boss reprimands you for something. It doesn't seem quite so nice. But at this point, like we just said, the relationship between man and God was a joy to both parties. Now think about that. That's what God intended, is that his relationship with you would be a joy to him, and it would be a joy to you. Mankind lived in simple dependence on God. God provided for their needs and affirmed them Affirmed them with his daily presence and companionship. I'm sorry, did I make you mad? <laughs> so the second point is that everything was as God intended. So here we go, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So here comes the serpent. He's talking to Eve. And what's the first thing he does? Cast, cast that. Right. Did God really say? And what does he say? That you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, is that what God said? Is that what God said? They wouldn't live very long, would they? <laughs> what did God say? One tree, right? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just one. So of all the trees, just one tree. All right? But that's what the serpent's up to. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, is that what God said? Look at it. No. What did God say? You must not eat it. But did he say you must not touch it? So what's happening already? 
She's getting confused, isn't she? And so now, when the serpent says, did God really say? And then she says, well, he did say this, but then she adds something. He said, don't touch it. Now, now what has God turned into in her mind? He's strict, right? It's not just don't eat, it's don't touch. Now, what happens when somebody's overly strict with us? Do we tend to trust that person? When it's like they're being unnecessarily strict, do we trust that person? So the serpent is on the mark. He knows how to manipulate these. Now think about it. They're simple and they're innocent. But why is that? Why are they simple and innocent? Right. They, they don't know evil. They've never seen evil. Now, you and I have seen it, haven't we? Probably more than we'd like. But think about it. They've never seen evil. They've never had somebody lie to them. They've never had somebody hurt them. They've never had somebody manipulate them. All they knew was God, and everything was perfect the way it was intended to be. So they're vulnerable. All right? So Eve responds by affirming what God did say, but she adds a restriction. So she's beginning to be a bit confused by this subversive questioning. The, the enemy has a plan, all right? Now, verse 4, he jumps, he goes right at it. He says, you will not surely die. Because that's what God has said. You must not eat of the fruit or you will die. He says, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent goes through the jugular. He contradicts what God has said, but then he adds a motive. He says God has a motive. God is up to something. You can't trust him. He's trying to hold you down. He wants to restrict you because he doesn't want you to be equal to himself. And the implication is that God cannot be trusted. So the third point is they were tempted to doubt God's goodness. Now what's so sad is did they have any reason to doubt God? No. No, not a one. But all it took was this little serpent saying, now wait a minute, are you sure that God's looking out for you? Now have you ever had that happen? Maybe in your younger years, maybe in your now years. Say, is God really good? Is he really looking out for me? It, does he have good things for me? Or is he holding me back? Is he holding out on me? Is he not giving me the really rich blessings that I deserve? So we're tempted not to trust God and to doubt his goodness. But at this point, they don't have any knowledge of evil. They are vulnerable and they're a bit naive. So I want you to notice what the serpent does not suggest. This is interesting. I thought about this. This is kind of the way my mind works. What if the serpent had said to them, why don't you guys go out and find an animal, one of the ones God created, one of the ones that you named, and just hurt it, kick it? What do you think that is said? Are you crazy? Yeah, why, right? Why? I mean, I, I like this animal. I named it. It likes me. Why would I hurt it? So why do you think the serpent didn't suggest that? Or what if the serpent said, why don't you just hurt your spouse. Say something unkind. Maybe you get physical with them. What would they have said? Why? <laughs> There's no point. Or if, he, or if the serpent said, why not just curse God to his face? This will be fun. You know what would have happened is they would have saw right through him, wouldn't they? So he has to be tricky. He has to be crafty. He has to be cunning. He has to sow a seed of doubt without really revealing who he really is. <clears throat> Crafty. And again, just like we talked about with the Gadarene demoniac, evil has a personality. Evil has a plan. It wants to deceive you. It wants to enslave you. And clearly, um, that's what the serpent's up to here. So had he done so, they would have figured out that he was a bad guy, right? If he'd have suggested they do something obvious. But with cunning, he presents a command this is important. He presents a command designed to protect, designed to preserve innocence as a sinister attempt to control and restrict. He paints God in a bad light and says, God's not really looking out for you. God's trying to hold you back. 
And this gets us every time, doesn't it? We're tempted to believe that someone in a position of authority is not looking out for us, but for themselves. They're really looking out for themselves. In college, I worked at a Chick-fil-A on the weekends, and um, when I started, there was a guy named, named David who was the operator, so he couldn't have been all that bad, because <laughs> same name, right? So I'm working for him, and he seems like a friendly guy. He's not around too much. Operators aren't always on, around every day. And uh, he took us to the Chick-fil-A ranch. We rode on a hayride. We had deer burgers, which was strange that we're eating that nut chicken. Um, but it was a nice time. I thought he was a nice guy, but I remember after a while, um, my colleagues were kind of chatting about him in the break room. And they would say things like, his parents have connections. You know, he's not really qualified to do this job. He's not, he's not nearly as sincere as he looks. And I wasn't, I wasn't asking about this. I wasn't inquiring about this. But just by you know, osmosis, it's kind of seeping into me. And over time, it's like, maybe he's not such a good guy. And isn't that a shame? He didn't do anything to earn that from me. But just being polluted by other people's comments. The comments of my coworkers influenced my opinion of my boss. So at this point in the story... I wonder why Adam and Eve, this, this just bothers me, you know. I, I think about what's not in the scripture sometimes. So that God's being accused. The enemy's saying he's not good. He's not looking out for you. Why didn't they just go talk to God about it? Right? Why didn't they go find God? Because he came around every day and said, God, I'm confused. The serpent's saying these things about you. And can you imagine what God would have done to the serpent? If his children came to him in trust, whoosh, you know, I can just imagine him whacking the serpent and pulverizing him. But it's not so unfortunate, so unfortunate that the serpent had already had been successful. He planted doubt in their hearts about a God whose behavior toward them should have left no doubts. And what's sad about the story isn't just that it happened but that it still happens, doesn't it? It still happens in your life. It still happens in my life. Why would I doubt a God who's done nothing but good? But we do. Verse 6 and 7, here's the, the crux of the story. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, because God's holding them back, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. It's interesting, isn't it? When they sin and they realize there's something wrong, what's the first thing they do? Cover it up, right? They find a way to try and cover it up. Boy, is that true. <laughs> Just like a child, what happens when a child does something they shouldn't? What's the first thing they do? They hide. They hide. Or they try to conceal. I saw this funny video of this little boy. He had a whole package of Oreos on his bed. And he was opening them up. And the mom burst in. And he tried furiously to throw them under the covers. But there's no hiding what he's been up to. Kids are so funny. Until it's not funny. Like when it's us. Okay. So Adam and Eve try their best to amend the situation by covering up. It's like, oh no. Something's wrong. Something's changed. In second grade... Um, I got in trouble at school. I don't even really remember why. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Um, but so I, I had to write a, my teacher made me write a note to my mom. Isn't that cruel? You know, tell your mom what you did, then take it home and have her sign it. So I didn't take it home. I put it in my desk and I did my very best to write in my mom's handwriting. <laughs> but when my teacher saw it, she because the handwriting looked suspiciously like the note that had already been written. So I had to write another note <laughs> and take it home to my mom. But do you think this made my situation better or worse? Worse. <laughs> you better believe it made it worse. And it's the same thing here. Again, I wonder, what if they had immediately confessed to God and said, God, I don't know what happened, but we, we, we blew it. We messed up. We disobeyed you. I wonder how things might have been different 
if they hadn't insisted on trying their best to cover up what they'd done. But we understand that, don't we? <clears throat> I understand that. You understand that. We all understand that need, that, that instinct to try to cover it up. But the makeshift covering out of the fig leaves they've provided for themselves, it's not enough. It's not enough. Keep that in mind. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord, like Bob said, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So God seeks out Adam and Eve. But their answer to the question gives away what's happened, isn't it? You ever see that with, the, with our kids? Or It's like their answer reveals everything. What have you been up to? Nothing. <laughs> what's that on your face? It's not chocolate. <laughs> it was her. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> you know, this is the first time that shame is recorded in the Bible. And I just wanted to say to you this morning, as your pastor, shame is not what God intended. You know what shame is. I know what shame is. Sometimes we use shame, don't we? Shame on you. Sometimes the media uses shame, don't they? But does God use shame? Never. Never, never, never. In fact, in the New Testament, when it says that God, he disciplines us. It's not judgment. It's discipline. And the purpose is always, always, always restoration. So I've had a season in my life where I felt like God was mad at me, where he was disappointed with me. And then I had to go back and read the scriptures. And that's not God. That's me. That's me and my guilt. That's me and my shame. God pleads with us. He implores us to return to him. He invites us to repent. He offers us forgiveness for all who believe. God doesn't deal in shame. That's something that we have caused. So this, I just find that encouraging. That's never what God intended. Verse 12. Here we go, the blame game. <laughs> the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And notice he doesn't say my wife. The woman, that woman that you put here with me. <laughs> Not, no amens just yet. <laughs> all right she gave me some fruit and i ate it then the lord said to the woman what is this you have done and the woman says the serpent deceived me and i ate which is true it's true but it doesn't absolve her responsibility okay so this is the first ever episode of the blame game he says she did it and she says the serpent did it but what is god looking for he's looking for confession isn't it? he's looking for humility because scripture says, uh, if you humble yourself, you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. And that holds true in our lives. We humble ourselves. All right, continue on verse 14. The serpent gets what's coming to him. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, what stands out to you about this two verses right away about the serpent? It didn't used to crawl. <laughs> Isn't that weird? So was the snake walking around? Looks like it. So that's part of the curse. The second thing I want you to notice is, is verse 15. Does anybody know what this is referring to? The offspring of the woman, the seed of the woman that he injures but that crushes him. Mankind. Somebody said this on his glance for me. It's Jesus. It's referring to Jesus. Scholars have a lot of agreement. This is referring to Jesus that one day the serpent will wound him. You see the passion of the Christ. Hopefully not the kids. <laughs> Pretty rough. But when he comes out of the grave, remember what he does? He stomps on the snake. Let's refer back to this passage. 
Messianic passage. So I don't want you to miss that in the midst of the worst imaginable outcome, God has set up everything perfectly. It couldn't get any better. And man, for no reason other than just being tricked and deceived, he ruins it. But in the midst of that, does God start wagging his finger? Now, he does give them consequences. But look here in verse 15. God already has a plan. He already has a plan to deal with sin. He already has a plan to send his son. He already has a plan to fix a problem that he didn't cause. Now, what kind of God is that? It's a good one, isn't it? Can I get an Amen. He already has a plan to fix a problem he didn't cause. He doesn't fly off the handle, but they do have consequences. And do we learn without consequences? No. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, <laughs> do we learn without consequences? No, we don't. I saw this funny video one time, and it was these parents that were struggling with grace. And so the kids had misbehaved, and the parents said, that's okay, we're going to give you grace this time. And then sure enough, not too long later, the kids misbehaved again. And the kids said, Grace, Grace. And they said, no, uh you're busted. <laughs> so we need, we need consequences. And, and a good God would do no less. But he doesn't kill them. But sadly, they are going to die. Just like we all do now as a result of Adam's sin. All right, so here is Eve's consequences. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to your children. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies, but I know you can give me an amen on that. <clears throat> Probably a grimmest amen. I've seen it. I didn't expect it. <laughs> but I've seen it. Um, and then this, this little passage is not often understood. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. It's not that the wife's just saying, oh, my husband's so great, and I just desire him all the time. And No, what that means is you're going to contend. You're going to contend with your husband to see who's in charge. Now, doesn't that ring true with our experience? Who's going to call the shots? Huh? I mean, I know that doesn't happen in your house. It certainly doesn't happen in mine. But actually, what this passage is referring to is there's, there's going to be a power struggle in the home between the husband and the wife. If you look back at the, the context in the scripture. So that's interesting to me. And it's, and it's sad. Um, now what is Adam's consequences? Okay, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So man has to work hard. Now, granted, this isn't Little House on the Prairie days, right? <laughs> man, I'm not Charles Engels out there plowing my fields. But there are people who still do agriculture, and it's hard work, isn't it? And if they, if they don't get enough rain, we were in China, and I, I witnessed with my own eyes what it's like for coffee farms climbing up and down these really sheer hills where there's an access road on the bottom and an access road on the top and then all in between they got to climb. And a lot of times it's people in their 60s out there plowing those fields and pruning those trees and harvesting those crops. <coughs> hard labor, hard labor. So that's Adam's consequence for this sin. All right, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. So this Eve receives her name for the first time. Up to that point, he just called her that woman. Okay. And now she's Eve. Okay. Verse 21, which I think is a key verse. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, garments of skin. Where do you think those came from? The animals, right? Now, is this something that God just manufactured out of thin air? Something had to die. And that's a key point with sin. Something had to die. God provides garments for Adam and Eve, and it's easy to overlook why this is significant. But in order for God to provide skins, an animal would have to die. 
Now, there's three things I want you to know about God that are really clearly expressed in this passage for me. Number one is that God is perfect. God cannot be associated with sin. And that's a good thing. We don't want an impure, corrupt God. That's what the, that's what the pagans had in those days. They had, they had gods that were mean. They had gods that were fickle. They had gods that wanted things from them but had nothing for them. When we went into missions training, we learned about tribal peoples. It's the same thing. They got gods and spirits that want things from them and are sometimes willing to require blood from them, but don't want to have anything for them and have no time for them. But our God is a God who is perfect. He cannot be associated with sin. The relationship between man and God was broken because of sin. And because man is now a sinner, he must leave God's presence and be banished from the garden. Secondly, God is just. He always punishes sin. And that's another good thing. Do we want sin to go unpunished? Maybe my sin. <laughs> right? Maybe my sin. But I don't want your sin. I don't want my enemy's sin to go unpunished. We, want, we need God to be just. And we need to, we need to believe that one day all the wrongs will be set right, don't we? Do you believe that? Do we need to believe that? There are a lot of things that go wrong in this world, and it needs to be set right. There needs to be a day of accountability. We just want it for others. <laughs> Not for ourselves, but we need justice. We need perfection. There needs to be a standard. There needs to be a standard, a right way to do something. We need that. It's in God's nature. But the third thing, so God's perfect, he can't be associated with sin. God is just, he always punishes sin. But God is loving. God is loving. In this situation, man is helpless to save himself. They tried, right? They got the fig leaves out, they tried to cover it up. But they couldn't save themselves. Death is required as payment for sin, but who provided the payment? God did himself. So in all of this, God is perfect, he's just, but he's also loving because he himself provides the payment. In this story is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do many years later. God paid the bill. So... As we see in verses 14 and 15, God had a plan even then to deal decisively with this problem of sin. And these principles would come into play. God's character does not allow him to compromise. And I'm glad for that. The wages of sin is death. And that's something our world needs to understand. We're sinners. We don't like to be called that. Sometimes people want to fight when you tell them they're a sinner. Talking to a friend this week who does door-to-door -door knocking and evangelism in social circles. And people are comfortable with God, but they're not comfortable with the idea that they're a sinner. But the wages of sin is death, but the third point is that God himself provides the payment. And that's why we can trust God. His character and his willingness to sacrifice his own son inspires us to trust him, right? When you think about problem that we're facing. That's what we love about movies, isn't it? When there's a, a self-sacrificial character who puts it all on the line to save others. Well, Jesus did that. God the Father did that by sending his own son. Can you imagine that? Offering up your own child for others. But not just others, for sinners like us. So what about you? Are you ever tempted to doubt God's goodness? We've seen in the story. They had absolutely no reason. But our lives are a little bit more complicated. We're not in the Garden of Eden. We don't have all of our needs met. You feel like you got all your needs met? So it's a little bit of a different situation, but is God any less trustworthy for us? So are you tempted to doubt God's goodness? Do you fall prey to the temptation of Adam and Eve? Does the enemy want to influence you to view God as restrictive and distant? Because that's what he was trying to do. He wanted them to think that God was out to hold them back and that God didn't really care. 
So let the birth of our Savior remind you and remind me that nothing could be further from the truth. And then we have the Garden of Eden to look at. Whenever you're discouraged, look at the Garden of Eden. Look at the way God intended for it to be. But then the second powerful example is look at Jesus. God sending his own son to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And so this is where Christmas begins. It begins in the Garden of Eden. It begins with a perfect, loving God forced to address a problem he did not cause. A kind, intimate father who met daily with his children who he provided for. When they chose not to trust him and to disobey his command that was designed to protect them and to preserve their innocence. And that's something we want so badly for our children. We want to preserve their innocence. And when their innocence is spoiled, it's so upsetting. God just wanted to protect them from the knowledge of evil. He just wanted them to know good. But when that happened, his justice demanded a response. And as a preview of what he would do many years later, he himself lovingly provided the payment required to cover man's sin. So as we enter into this Christmas season, let's consider in a new light all that God has done for us. Let's consider a perfect Savior who is God's eternal solution to our desperate problem. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I've got some homework for you as I close. Three things, simple. I'd like you this week to read the Christmas story. Luke 2, about 20-something verses. Just read it this week. Get, give yourself, get yourself in the mood. Read it together if you're willing around the dinner table. Read it. Get yourself in the mood. Second... There's a movie called The Nativity um, that I would encourage you to watch this Christmas season. Maybe the Flannerys can hook you up with a link, an Amazon link or something. Um, but it's really well done, kind of transport you back into the historical context of the story of the birth of Jesus. And that'll kind of get you in the mood. And then thirdly, I would encourage you to plan an act of service um, this Christmas. And the church is already doing that. So get involved with that. Find somebody else that you can take a meal to. Send a hard to, but start thinking outside yourself this Christmas. Read the Christmas story. Watch the nativity and then plan an act of service with your family before this Christmas. Pray with me. God, thank you so much for today and thank you, God, that you were willing to solve our problem. I mean, it's our problem. It's our sin. You didn't cause it. You didn't make it happen. Um, it's something that we did all on our own, God. And we, we try our best to cover it up. We try our best to deal with it and manage it, God, and make it right. But we just can't. We need a holy, just, and loving God to provide the payment for our sin that we can't provide for ourselves. And you did that when you sent Jesus to the earth in the form of a baby. He had to suffer through the same growing pains that we did. Thirst, hunger, emotion, and then eventually the cruelest, most brutal death that could be devised by, by the Romans who were very skilled at it. And he did that. He willingly accepted that. He took his cross upon him for our sake. He took our sin upon him so that we might be free. And we're so grateful for that. May we remember that, forget about Santa, forget about all the the frosty and the, and the trimmings. Let us remember Jesus this Christmas. Let us keep Christ at the center of Christmas during this Christmas season. So as we have opportunities to talk and to share with people about Jesus, the true reason for the season that you would use us, God, that we'd be faithful to take every opportunity. It's in Jesus' name.